Okay, so we are going to talk about the following topic now. So we are going to uh, consider the convergence of the finite element method, right? So convergence of, well, in particular, Galerga's method. So in the previous lecture, we have seen um, a theorem which. Uh, proved or established the convergence of Ritz methods. So today I would like to do the same thing for Galerga's method, which is a bit more generic. However, before we will do so, I have to introduce a certain, I have to introduce a couple of uh, concepts that uh, originate from functional analysis. So for the sake of an example, let's consider the following case. So suppose that we want to solve minus Laplacian of u is equal to f in omega. And suppose that we have a boundary condition u on the boundary is equal to zero. So we start with this very simple boundary value problem. Well, for this boundary value problem, we can write down the following weak form, right? So we can write down find u in h10 and in which H zero, in which the zero stands for u being zero on the boundary, and so this is an essential boundary condition. So we have to impose this boundary condition explicitly in the weak formulation that we have seen earlier. Find u in H10 such that, and then of course we have integrated by parts, and then we get the gradient of u times the gradient of phi, the omega is equal to the right hand side phi times f the omega for all phi in H10. So this is the weak form. Well, the first thing that uh, we are going to do is we are going to write down a lemma which states the um, uniquely defined solution to this variational problem. So let's say this is boundary value problem BVP, okay, and this is the weak form. So we are going to consider existence and uniqueness to this um, um, variational problem. However, before we do so, I have to introduce a couple of things. For the sake of this example, we can see uh, that this integral is linear in u and linear in phi. So in fact, this is a bilinear form. So we can introduce a bilinear form A of u and phi such that it is defined by the integral over omega of the gradient of u times the gradient of phi. Of course, this holds in this specific example. And this guy can be seen as a dot product or an inner product between the function phi and the function f. So I introduce a notation phi, f as an L2 inner product, which is given by the integral of phi times f d omega. And so this is the notation that I'm introducing right now. So, um, <clears throat> so as you can see, a bilinear form in general, so A is a bilinear form. In particular here, it's a bilinear form in H10. Okay, so it's a bilinear form in H1. So now let's suppose that we have a generic Hilbert space. And so we have completeness we have a norm space which is complete as well as the norm is um, as well as we have an inner product induced norm okay so we have a generic Hilbert space H okay and of course in this case we have H1 okay so we have H1 and which actually means that we can also write down an inner product um, we can also write down um, a, a norm in H1 in which, is, in which is given by u in h1 and which is defined by the square of this guy is defined by the integral over u squared plus the gradient of u squared okay so this is the definition of the h1 norm and which is which we are going to use later on for the sake of this example but now let's suppose we have a generic Hilbert space with some inner product u comma phi let's say in h as well as, an, as a norm um, u uh, in h, uh, which is given by u comma u, and then we take the square root of this guy. Okay? So this is the generic Hilbert space. And now 
we are going to introduce the following notions. So this bound, so this uh, bilinear form, uh, so this, this form A of u and phi is bilinear, if we can write down alpha 0, alpha 1 times u plus alpha 2 times v, comma phi is given by alpha 1 times a u phi plus alpha 2 times a uh, v, comma phi. And so it's linear in the first coordinate. And it's also linear in the second coordinate. And so for the second coordinate we can do the same thing. And for bilinearity. And so in the phi coordinate similar. So this is what defines a bilinear form. And so of course it's very easy to demonstrate that this is a bilinear form. So now um, I'm also introducing the following concept. And that is that the bilinear form A on, on the Hilbert space is bounded or continuous so you can actually prove that boundedness and continuity is, are the same is for, for, for linear functionals if we have the following if there is a k larger than zero such that a of u and phi now, now I take the magnitude of this guy is larger or is lesser or equal to k times u in h times phi in h, phi norm in h. And this should hold for all u and phi in h. So if this is true, then we call this bilinear form bounded or continuous. So we also have coercivity, coerciveness. Okay, so the bilinear form is coercive. If there is a C that is not that is positive such that A of U comma U is larger or equal to C times the norm times the square of the norm of U of the H norm in U. So this is what defines boundedness and coerciveness. So now we have seen bilinearity, boundedness and coerciveness. Furthermore, if you look at this type of, um, if, you if you look at, for instance, eh, so if you look at this example, so let's have a look at this example, then of course this guy eh, can be written as, well, it's this integral over phi times f d omega, right? And now if I'm interested in the absolute value, the magnitude, so here we get the magnitude, and then we can apply gauge schwarz inequality, in order to get phi okay, in L2 times F in L2. And of course this can be estimated from above once again in the H1 norm by setting this phi okay, in the H1 norm times F. Well by this definition eh, we can also see that this, this form is bounded so this form is also bounded in H1 and also of course in H10 and so this is this is one thing that we are going to need later on so now let's have a look at this bilinear form in this specific example with respect to boundedness and coerciveness okay. so now what we have is the following so here we have A of U and phi Right? And let's write down the absolute value, the magnitude. So this guy is given by the absolute value of the integral over omega of the gradient of u times the gradient of phi. And now we can apply gauche schwarz inequality. Because u and phi are both in H1. So now we can apply gauche schwarz So here we get the L2 norm of the gradient of u Okay, times the L2 norm of the gradient of phi. But of course, if we look at the L2 norms here, okay, for the gradient, then of course we can bound it from above by this H1 norm. So in other words, we are going to bound this above from above by the H1 norm. So in other words, we can bound this from above by U 
in H1 times phi in H1. So in other words, the constant is equal to 1. As you can see here, k is equal to 1. Well, and the result, the reason for this is that this bilinear form is symmetric in this, is symmetric in this particular example. And so we could apply gauge schwarz inequality. And so in other words, this bilinear form is bounded. Okay. So now I'm going to consider uh, coerciveness in the next chunk. So here we stop now, and then in the next chunk we will consider coerciveness.